Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session on the second day of the Benarch, uh, the seventh con Congress at uh, Cardenas Technical University. We are here to present to you five papers, and our authors are lined up and waiting their, uh, their presentation order to talk with you and to explain what they are up to. First of all, uh, we have Beryl Kapusul Balji uh, presenting, and then the second uh, paper will be presented by Shema Duman. And the third presenter, uh, we are still waiting for Gamze Atay and Altai Cholak. And the fourth uh, presenter will not be uh, with us because of uh, technical issues and Tuba Ekis who is this person. And the fifth, the last presentation will be made by Duygu Tintash. And I will introduce each uh, presenter before the uh, presentation video goes on. Uh, actually, we can, we, can, we can directly start with the first presentation, yeah. Beryl Kapusuz Balje has been welcome, well, by the way, uh, Beryl has been teaching at Gazi University Architecture Department uh, since 2012. It's a long uh, academic history. Her research focuses on the 20th century, uh, art, architectural theory and history, architectural representation regarding theory and history of architectural photography and exhibition histories. It goes on like this. And then earlier, she conducted research in the historical archives of Venice Biennale. It's so exciting. And today she is presenting crazy objects of art architecture in exhibit, revisiting Molino Stucchi project as a transversal exhibition in the Venice Biennale of 1975. So, Bill, it's your turn. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank to all for their efforts to make this Congress happen and for giving me a room for sharing my ideas around the theme, other architectures. Before I start, I would like to note that this paper was prepared on the basis of my PhD dissertation completed in 2018, and all the archival visual material is from the Venice Biennale Contemporary Art Historical Archives, which I had the chance to conduct my research. In the late 60s and 70s, while artists use architectonic forms in exhibitions, architects pursued the artistic category of installations as a form of architectural production and proposed new special conditions for socially oriented practices. This other practice that is defined as making for the exhibition ascribes a flat ontology to disciplinary concepts, processes and techniques, while bringing out the repetition or resemblance of special works in large scale visual art or architecture exhibitions and pointing out their insignificant categorization today. To unfold the title of the study, Art Architecture Coupling, that refers to a field beyond visual arts and architecture, necessitates a redefinition of its practitioners and categories, which are aimed to be represented here through characterization of the transdisciplinary and transcategorial works of artistic practice. Accordingly, an emphasis on the processual and performative character of the exhibition as a project suspends the object-subject or work-weaver division and assigns them an agency in equal terms. Architecture can be exhibited not only with the conventional representational objects as we know them, but through special agency as well. The exhibitionary work as an other practice defines a form of practice that does not convey meaning from another object, but produces that meaning to itself through subject object relations while uh, traversing disciplines, their definitions and categories. It displaces the centralistic approach of the representational exhibition categories that foreground the creator, subject, or author with the decentralizing perspective of the processual exhibition format as a project, including various actors that perform. 
Yet their distributed agencies within the relational assemblage of the exhibition are brought into question, drawing upon the speculative concept of quasi-object and how quasi-object of art architecture performs in the transformation or reassembling of the dynamic social space, such as an exhibition, is open to discussion. Drawing upon French philosophers and cohorts, Michel Serres and Bruno Latour's conceptualization of the term, quasi-objects in exhibit are argued to have an agency in establishing the dialogue between disciplines through their inseparable presence in those exhibitionary environments. They also have the ability to transform the spatial programs for the practitioner, artists, architects. It is suggested that the transversal exhibition necessitates multiple readings with its material relations that determine its very own making. Venus Biennale and a peculiar historical moment of its decentralization from the academic arts is recalled in terms of its having a social orientation with the assignment of an architect as a director for the very first time and the articulation of visual arts and architecture in mid 1970s. Could exhibition be an agent, an intermediary to think about the city, the architecture, the public realm? That was the question posed by the architect director of the 1975 Biennale, Vittorio Gregotti, while creating another exhibition, the Mulinostaki project. The project was based on architectural proposals for the rehabilitation of the old factory structure, Mulinostaki, located on the island of Judake in Venice. It was an open call competition and workshop, an invitation to think about the large um, area on which the former flour mill, uh, Mulinostaki, with an intention to finally exhibit works produced on the site. The exhibition process was something Rigotti specifically wanted to achieve, the exhibition itself being a means of expression, researching by making for exhibition. As a transversal project, the case of the 1975, event that marks the art architecture coupling in the Biennale history is reassessed through archival visual documents, deciphering material and social relations of its performative processes established by different conceptualizations and materializations of the quasi-object in exhibit. I will present very briefly different conceptualizations of quasi-object notion through various works exhibited in the Mulinostaki event, addressing the materiality of the exhibitions in various forms. The Italian artist Gianni Colombo proposed a conceptual work entitled Elastic Thoughts on, uh, that overflows the area. Colombo noted area and volume on the collage, including an aerial photograph of the Murunasaki representing the old factory building together with its environment, Venice, taken on a contextual approach. The material relation between the factory building and the city finds its abstract form in the elastic space created through the materiality of his work. The changing relationship of the elastic lines creates different spatial conditions when any active viewer of the work changes the notes of the composition. Having its intentionality through its multiple possible forms, quasi-object of this exhibition has an agency in the relationship between the conceptual and production processes, between the thoughts on the factory and the elastic space created in infinite forms of volumetric configuration in which the weaver partakes as well. Dutch painting and sculpture artist Marc Brousset proposed to build, to build a large pyramid sculpture on the land given as a thinking tool for the idea competition and placed a 1 to 20 scale model of the sculpture in the exhibition. Brousset's fictional pyramid would define a new action program for those who using the pyramid, enabling another kind of visual relationship with Mulinostaki. The pyramid or platform superimposing on each other are quasi-objects having an agency that presents to its users a physical climbing in and out of the clocks on the steps and visual relationship with Moulinot from an elevation above the ground or sea level through itself. The construction of watching Stucky experience created a fictional exhibition as a whole composition, including the object of thought, which is the mill, object of action, the platforms, and the place installed, which is the Venice, and the users, which are the active viewers. The architectural duo Mario Ceroli and Gianfranco Fini installed a container in San Mark Square, similar to the ones that large-scale artworks are transported in, with the names of the artists and architects partook in the exhibition on it. It was a symbolic container carrying all the thoughts on the mill in it and was put into fire by Cheroli and Finney, recalling the fires that the old mill went through in its history. Finally was moved to the exhibition space, an old salt warehouse. The spatiality proposed by the architects is constructed through the displacement of the box, 
The archival photographs presents a narration through multiple spatial temporalities in which you can see here, the container dismantled, transport, um, transported, left as a pile on the people uh, where on people sat, became a room, burned and reconstructed in the exhibition space. This very site-specific work not only proposes an insight for the city of Venice with its conceptual construct, but also produces multiple spatial and material constructs overreaching the initial intentions of the architects. Regarding the processual and performative character of the work that involves contingent acts and actors throughout the exhibition, the box of Cerulli and Fini is regarded as a quasi-object. To conclude, the spatial works produced as a response to a call to rethink a spatial complexity, Mulinostaki of Venice, are partly revisited by means of the visual documentation that could give in a place in the exhibition catalogs, but could be revealed through archival research. Drawing upon this methodological approach and the conceptualizations of quasi-objects, this particular exhibition in its very own conceptual and material conditions be becomes visible in different social and spatial terms and produces other meanings, practices of other ways of doing architecture. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for preparing such a nice video for us, Beryl. And uh, I guess we are going to take the questions at the end of the uh, all presentations. And then we go for the second presenter, who is Shema Duman, co-authoring with Nilgün Kulola. And Shema is a researcher at Wan Yuzingil University and doing her PhD in architecture at Cardenas Technical University. Her paper looks at the case of Sanjaklar Mosque award-winning architecture to discuss abstraction and empathy through a reading of the art historian Willem Moringa. And the title is Other Art Prompt, an examination of the theory of abstraction and empathy in the private Sanjak Darmask. So Shema's video is running now. Hello everyone, I'm Shema Duman Gültepe. I would like to present you the other art prompt and examination of theory of abstraction and I feeling in the private Sanjaklar Moscow. So let's get started. The scientific world, which turned the psychology in the 19th century, focused on subjectivist aesthetic interpretation in art. In this context, Theodor Lipp's theory of Einfühlung has been the most consistent and supported idea uh, when interpreting art styles. Lipp says that we perceive words of art with an inner feeling. According to Einfühlung, what makes an art object beautiful is our inner sense of it. However, this interpretation is not sufficient for some theorists. For example, the art historian William Moringer accepts I'm fooling, but when he looks at the history of art, he sees that this interpretation is valid only for Greek, Roman, and Renaissance art. So, what is the other art prompt? Woringer corresponds to this with the word abstraction. According to Woringer, art periods that produce art with Einfühlung are in a positive interaction with the world. However, in places where divine religions and complex world perception exist, such as Eastern art, art's work, works were uh, produced with the instinct of abstraction. But these two concepts are not opposite to each other. They express two processes that can be intertwined. Therefore, the art prompt turns into a negative or positive perception of the universe and impulses of abstraction and unfolding. Hereafter, it finds a way for itself with some other factors and creates its own style. While this theory is suitable for art such as sculpture and painting, it also affected architecture. Boringer supported his 
theory with the building features from different periods. However, Boringer mentioned its spatial situation by saying that Gothic architecture was influenced uh, by the psychology of its time and created its own artistic prompt. Our study is different in that it examines Islamic architecture and a mosque for the first time with this theory. Firstly, we make the basic distinctions of this theory. We identify the dual concept of the theory with various references and interpretation, for example, the concept of compulsorily and order or stability and flow. After the determination of these concepts, the building elements that the architectural works will be evaluated for the timeline. This determination was created by the method of content analysis with the words that are mostly included in Boringer's book. Afterwards, Sanjaklar Mosque was analyzed Within the content of the study, Sanjaklar Mosque, which was designed by leaving aside the discussion of how a contemporary and modern mosque should be, it was designed by trying to see the place, the time, the context, and the actors. The architect Emrarolas, who aims to find the essence of the place of worship and design the mosque, from this point of view, has tried to remove mosque architecture from being an abstract design issue. Sanjaklar Mosque, which is read uh, with dual concept in the context of Boringer's Corsaria, is a building that identifies with nature and its users. However, it was concluded that the designer determines uh, a style that frequently uses the instinct of abstraction due to architect's interpretation and transcendent values. In this context, Sanjaklar Mosque is a building that chooses its own art prompt, as in Boringer's thesis, depend on the psychology of the time. And conclusion. Thoughts, ideologies, world views, and psychology brought by the condition of the time find their counterparts in the design of a building and architecture. What is wanted to be examined with this theory is the psychological sub reasons that direct the art of a nation or period. In this context, the theory which reaches accepted result in the field of art has been examined within the content of the study. When it comes to Moscow design, although a typology that has become a formal burden in Turkey comes to mind, the Moscow's that does not have formal constant determined by any source. Considering the readings made and the sample examined, Sanjaklar Moscow exhibited a style that dealt with inherent are demands into the other way. In this Moscow example, the tradition, tradition has been questioned and reinterpreted. The coexistence of the abstraction and Einfühlung makes it possible to infer that the building creates its own artistic prompt as a reactivity expression. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you for this beautiful presentation, Shema. It was navigated and used to follow. And thank you for this. Uh, I guess like it could be nice to uh, make a connection between the previous presentation and this one because I directly made uh, some kind of connection because previous in the previous one we talked about quasi objects and in a way uh, like an ob like an object behaving like a like an actor like a like a social catalog catalyzer and here uh, Shema is trying to uh, evaluate the Sanjaklar mosque in terms of how 
uh, how the mosque architecture can be abstracted uh, from its form to behave like a social cat uh, catalyzer. So maybe there is a discussion at the end. All right. So the third presentation we are going to listen to belongs to Gamze Atay and Altay Cholak. They are not here right now, but we are going to listen to their video that they prepared for us. And Gamze and Altay are coming from Chukurova University located in Adana, and their paper examines an unbuilt but award-winning project of Richard Rogers through the conceptual codes of technology, flexibility, energy, economy, and society. And the title of that video will be Perusal of Richard Rogers' Architecture via the Zip Up House. Hello, I'm Gamze Atay. I'm going to present the study titled Perusal of Richard Rogers' Architecture via the Zip Up House. As in all disciplines, discussions, manifestos, and discourses on theoretical, scientific, and social platforms in the discipline of architecture are pertinent to practice. The structures, which serve as manifestos of these theoretical inquiries, attract attention and loom large in architectural environments. Nevertheless, other projects that reflect the professional discourse of architects and remain in the form of architectural representation that cannot be built and therefore cannot take their necessary place in the literature are also worth discussing. For this purpose, it's aimed to explicate the professional discourse of Richard Rogers, the architect who received the Riva Gold Medal in 1985, the Riverside Lord title in 1996 and the Prisker Award in 2007 for his contributions to the architectural profession and nominated for many other awards besides this in the context of other works through the CPAP house which could not be turned into practice although it was awarded in the architectural project competition. The British architect Richard Rogers put forward many actions and discourses on the livable environment and architecture and produced literature related to urban, economic, social and ecological issues, eloquent architectural projects that support them. For this purpose, he discussed social and ecological problems under the headlines of population, raw materials and environment which he defined as three main variables of human life. He regarded these three variables as the main study topics in architectural structures and explicated the built environment in the respect. Upon considering the applied structures of Rogers, one can claim that they were formed in the light of all these discourses. Nonetheless, it would be possible to distinguish the CIPAP house, which was a preliminary experiment of Richard Rogers' technology-centered sustainable architecture approach, and it was never been implemented or could not be implemented, and in this context has gained the distinction of being the other work of the architect. The Zipop House is a residential project designed by Rogers together with Sue Rogers for a competition. The main purpose of this competition, which was organized under the title of The House of Today by DuPont Chemical Company that adopted the principle of producing sustainable and innovative solution in 1968, was revealing creative ideas within the context of innovation in local architecture. The award of this competition, in, in which Rogers participated with his CPAP house, was the implementation of the selected project. The CPAP house, described by Rogers as a transparent and flexible tube, 
was found successful by the jury of the competition. But it was considered as a design far ahead of its time and was awarded the second prize for the project and therefore could not be implemented. Nonetheless, this work of Rogers is quite crucial in terms of being the first theoretical research he has conducted on the extent to which a modern house can be independent of the constraints of traditional construction methods. Even though the structure could not be put into practice, it was the first project of Rogers' discourse. This house, which is a visionary model in terms of testing the potential of prefabricated materials, is designed with load-bearing footings that connect with the floor in an adjustable manner rather than the conventional basic compression. Thus, it was pleasant to be mounted anywhere or easily moved to a new area, regardless of the conditions of the topography. In the formation of the plan, flexibility was entirely prioritized and all areas, including the wet area, were organized in a way that could be rearranged by the user upon request. Therefore, the system offered the user more than one space configuration. Within the frameworks of all these contexts, a con conceptual analysis process was conducted on the CIPAP house in the study. The content analysis is used as a method, the texts and transcripts of rigid ledgers pertinent to ZIPAP files were summarized by systematically following the concepts and categories. The impact of obtained categories on large-scale buildings which loomed large in Rogers narratives and had a large place in the world of architecture such as the George Pompidius Center in the Millennium Dome and Lloyd's buildings are discussed as a result of this analysis. As a result, in the qualitative readings made on different building groups of Richard Rogers, it was seen that the concepts that emerged depending on the program, idea and function of the structures can change, but the upper categories are similar. In other words, we can say that the rhetoric of the architect in the CIPA files is integrated with the philosophy of architecture and manifests itself in all design approaches. Thank you for your listening. So thank you for the video, Gamze and Altai, if you are watching us. And the fourth presentation uh, is made by Tuba Ekis, who is not with us today because of technical issues. And Tuba is a professional architect practicing at a construction firm called Ekizler. She is a graduate of Istanbul Kültür University and today presenting her paper titled Gene Z Housing, Threshold Housing. And as the world goes through pandemic conditions and dramatic changes these days, our houses are likely to get affected. And it will be interesting to listen to Tuba's presentation uh, which is looking at a new definition for the housing use of Gene Z to, the give, to give us hints about the future uh, scenarios of housing. So. Hello, my name is Tuba Ekis. I will present to you the Gen Z housing, threshold housing, which I consider as the other place. With Gen Z, the world has begun to digitalize and the need for physical spaces has begun to change. The aim of the study, which started with the assumption that the digital world, which causes functional and spatial changes, will also create a break in terms of housing use, is to determine the points where Gen Z differs from Gen X and Y. In order to understand the changes in the housing field together with Gen Z, 
the framework developed by Altman and Kimmers for the relationship between culture and environment was used. Within the scope of interactions gathered under five headings, changing with Gen Z were reached by literature review. The Internet, which connects the world to otherness, provided the McLuhan's global village term, allowed communication independent of time and space, and estranged the world by moving physical into the virtual and the virtual into the physical. In the digitalizing world, since certain functions and spaces create breaks, there should be a break in terms of housing use. Born into a hyper-connected world between 1995 and 2010, Gen Z is the first generation to experience virtual connectedness, the global village, since birth. The increase in the level of attachment brings social interaction to the virtual platform. These new experience heralds special changes by causing the boundaries of private and public spaces to become blurred and intertwined. Globalizing culture is affecting people and places. Even the sense of belonging can be digitized to be expressed with hashtags. It is seen that in each of four basic stages in history, hunter-gatherer are agriculture, industry and information age, social thresholds have been passed and the living culture has changed, and this change is reflected in the spaces. Cities and people are constantly interacting and transforming each other. In the industrial age, the emergence of the concept of leisure has influenced people and gave birth to the flanner. The results of the annual survey conducted by IKEA in 2019 show that housing still retains its emotional meaning around the world, but new needs are on the agenda. The way to make a house feel like a real home is to provide equal opportunities for privacy and social life. Thanks to social media, the concept of being alone has changed and the possibility of online business has emerged despite physical loneliness. Digital shares are transforming individuals in the multi-connected residence. The role of the architect also changes. In the future, it is predicted that a consultancy-based and network-based understanding of architecture will dominate. Before the Gen Z, housing was called the threshold People as prosumer, spaces as internet cafes and Starbucks pass through the thresholds. On the other hand, outdoor activities, such as cinema and working, home office, have been moved to the 21st century house. Also, unlimited Wi-Fi and personal screens have replaced the act of gathering by dissolving the time-space dependency. With all these historical breaks, today's people who are outside when inside, inside when outside, who socialize with Wi-Fi, who can stand out from the crowd and share their loneliness, who feel need for communication and individuality at the same time. The concept of threshold housing is derived from Stavri Divis, definition of threshold, which is today's housing, which is privatized, reopened as it becomes privatized and seeks its physical existence by establishing a relationship with otherness in the virtual environment. Along with Gen Y, Sharon Economy, Airbnb, Uber are suggest for the increase in housing prices, decrease in salaries, recession, loneliness problems. At the housing scale, co-housing, Multi-generational homes suggestions were presented and the search for shared and common life was started. The increase in the time spent at home with the pandemic and quarantine process has made users fill their expectations from home, communication with the other and other housing needs. With the pandemic, the house loses its private character by being completely open to the public space. 
One of the most striking differences among the survey results is that Gen Y and Z individuals use tablet phones in many places. Televis television leaves its gatherer nature to the individuality of the tablet and phone. Between generations, the biggest difference has emerged in the bedrooms. While the bedroom is the private space of Gen X, Gen Y and Z can even use it for socialization. The increase in the value of bedrooms may result in the transformation of bedrooms into expert rooms where fulfill all personal needs in the future. Bringing the public actions to the house. Opening the house to the public in the virtual environment transforms the house into a context space that opens to otherness. This process reminded that threshold spaces should be created between open and closed, private and public spaces, so that the content captured in the virtuals should also be applied in the physical environment. Thank you for watching. All right, we quickly go to the last presentation. And Duygu Tintash is here. And uh, we are going to listen to a presentation video. And uh, let me introduce Duygu first. Duygu teaches architecture at uh, TED University. And uh, previously, she conveyed research at Middle East Technical University and Columbia University, GS, uh, GSAPP. On the one hand, she places her research in the field of architecture and design theory at the intersection of design and technology. And on the other hand, she leads a prize winner practice called Motto Architecture, and she will be presenting us the paper titled Furry, Hairy, and Cloudy Architectures of the Synthetic Environment. So let's listen to her. Hi, this is Duygu Tuntash. I will be briefly presenting my paper, Furry, Hairy, and Cloudy Architectures of the Synthetic Environment. Nature is a perpetual source for many design-related research areas and becomes a prolific source for bio-inspired innovation and technologies. Architecture's relation with it has become a focus for the last few decades as architects and designers try to understand and learn from nature through mimicking its forms and geometries, rules and behaviors, and materialities. Borrowing computational methods to understand and incorporate the underlying organization and structure of some natural phenomena it becomes possible to recreate the complexity that natural formations embody. Access to the underlying uh, organizational structure of some biological and natural phenomena through the vision of philosophy of mind and cognitive science, using the developments in technology in general and computer science in specific, have deeply affected, even inverted, some neglected accounts in design, namely organicism, intricacy, complexity, growth, randomness, and etc., which were previously regarded as irrational, subjectivist, intuitionist, therefore unreliable. A reintroduction of these concepts in design research and practice has become possible through inquiries into the increased capacity of machine computation, creating as well an intellectual reversal of the effects, which can be observed in the altered concerns, methodologies, and tendencies. This has led to an expansion of architectures, architectures, disciplinary reach and incorporations, and the emergence of new fields of research, which in return have changed, shaped, and altered the intellectual uh, landscape of designers. Superseding the earlier understanding of space and composition, the concept of field enters the world of architecture with Stanford Quinter's adoption of the term from the mathematical field theory of thermodynamics and electrodynamics. Uh, in the late 90s, without opting for any direct physical correspondence between natural flows and their actualization in architecture, Stan Allen proposed field conditions as non-figural responses to a context. Uh, counter to the conventional modernist modes of composition that, for him, evidently fails to reciprocate and manage the complexities of architecture and urban context. Through field diagrams, he suggested to drop conventional top-down approach to design and explore the possibility space provided by the dynamism and inter indeterminacy of flow formations, crowd behaviors, and etc. 
In her PhD dissertation, Pia Edna Brown includes her drawings of fur fields as postcards for her friends. She deduces from her process of drawing that it's not possible to pre-plan the whole from the beginning since I quote, the flow seemed to have its own push or its own will through the local relations of the lines, unquote. Not much adding to Stenelon's definition of the field, but experiencing, experiencing the multitude of individual forces that drive her act out, Pia Edna Brown confirms, I quote, they are, similar, uh, they are fields of similar units in flow formations. The flow is a collective activity, a multitude of units that fro uh, form a differentiated continuity. A mass of individual units is connected through common internal relations and laws of interrelation. Collective moments offer a sense of tendencies of relations therein." Unquote. Inferring from the definitions and discussions on the concept of fields, the act of repetition is an essential condition to establish the multiplicity of relations that constitute any larger, more general relationship formations. In her article, Pia Edna Brown and Alice Andrasek inform about the necessity of repetition in the computational design process to achieve intelligence in computational tools that only accumulates through practicing, to cultivate a sense of what works algorithmically. They define algorithmic agency as a procedure for computing a defined set of relations, usually involving the repetition of an operation where every particular has its own behavioral refrain, it assesses the ifs and else's and then acts over and over. In the proposal for National Art Museum of China, Roland Snooks and Robert Stuart uh, Smith converged two design strategies, turbulent algorithm and explicit modeling of cloud-like forms into a feedback relationship in which an outcome of one strategy becomes the input for the other, providing that they become an inseparable whole. The projects which Snooks and his team, design, his team designed, the National Art Museum of China and the Kazakhstan symbol, fostered the emergent capacity of turbulent behavior algorithm. Again, the final form is established between an intuitive nature metaphor and the organizational complex of algorithmic computation by articulating a cloud-like form to direct surface modeling with patterns of turbulent fluids. Snooks claims that the resulting formal language for both projects a language composed of hairy, fibrous, and blurred elements is a highly personal formal language. In this slide, we see two projects by Alisa Andresek with difference in scale and resolution. In the first project, Cloud Osaka is an outcome of a complex synthesis at the scale of a master plan, in which Andresek aims to create an alien approach to the aesthetics of strange and unseen. In this specific case, the source of inspiration is the river of people, and algorithmic agencies defined as a custom computational tool set imposed upon a box of cloud uh, generated with fluid dynamics. Inspired by cloud formations and weather events, Cloud Pergola is a 3D lattice structure designed to be exhibited uh, at the 2018 Venice Biennale. An algorithm of multi-agent systems is used in the design of the pavilion, in which these agents are regarded as active discrete elements whose behavior is determined by a collection of rules, often uh, based on stimulus-response logic. Interested in the exploratory and generative ways of using nature formations, such as flow, hair, cloud formations, in the design process, this study claimed that the computational tools and algorithmic agents support designers by changing perception or aiding to explore the complexities of these natural forces and formations that are not directly intelligible to human mind. The focus of the paper was the synthetic fields in which the designers who research on and practice extensively with algorithmic procedures um, in, um, and custom calls for their design to speculate, improvise, and intervene in the, these automated procedures of computation. Within such a synthetic uh, environment, human and non-human uh, non -human assemblages are as distributed and impure models can be observed where design intentionality is generated, exchanged, and hybridized in the process of continuous feedback, both from human and non-human agencies. Selected architectural cases exemplified the ways the synthetic environment offers for architecture, a possible space where non-systemic, intuitive, speculative design decisions can develop by engaging with the potentials of computational procedures.
Thank you for your interest. All right, it was nice to start with the Venice Biennale and end with the Venice Biennale. So nice connection. I think conference organizers has, have made a good, uh, good connection between papers and put them together for us to discuss some interesting ideas. All right. Uh, is there any question? Can I see any questions? No, not yet. From the background, is there any question? No. Okay. Shall we start from the end and go to the beginning or the reverse? How do you feel? Like, Duygu is here, Beryl is here. Maybe you say hi. Hi. <laughs> and Shema. Uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, uh, may I ask a question to Duygu first? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you showed us a couple of examples from synthetic architecture, which is your definition. And it was cool to see different cases that tries to mimic uh, nature in a way that can create um, socially interactive architectural space or space without architecture, or uh, I don't know, how do you define? And uh, how, do, how, how, how do you see the future of this research? I mean, you collected a, club, a couple of, uh, you made a couple of reviews about so, uh, these examples. And I wonder if you are going to develop a classification or if you are going to develop a workflow that these, that, are, that, are, that you think that the authors of these examples possibly followed. And I mean, what is next? Um, well, actually this is rather, uh an old research for me. It's been sort of three years and the examples uh, again uh, from 2016 and 18 and so on. Uh, so before this study, I had uh, written a paper, published a paper, which is actually a general, more general umbrella categorization of these uh, approaches in the computational architecture. Uh, it was um, um, and this research, this part that I have uh, presented is also, again, a small portion of my PhD thesis, so you can, and anyone interested uh, can look at that, it's an open source. Um, now, uh, from this, uh, today's perspective, uh, I actually, for the presentation, I wanted to, you know, add more examples and have a more scalar understanding uh, of different degrees of this uh, nature technology architecture relationship so uh, this is um, uh, these examples are rather maybe in the middle um, you know hybrid in the sense that the, the technology and uh, the nature's language or formations you know come together uh, creating forms or uh, formulations let's say for architects uh, and so on and maybe at, at the far edge it might be uh, we can mention maybe some more uh, natural material, for example, directly uh, relating to architecture. Yani it can be uh, more material conditions and maybe on the far edge, far uh, end, it might be more um, uh, AI, um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, used in architecture, for example. So, um, Instead of maybe grouping, I tried, to, uh, I sort of grouped in the paper, so uh, uh, we can also refer to the full paper, but also in the general sense, I think instead of categories, we can have different approaches and, you know, kind of find a may maybe three-dimensional mapping of these, you know, approaches. So uh, it's very hard to, you know, uh, put borders in between or, you know, have a very, you know, sharp, sharp uh, differentiation in between. Um, but I mean, uh, 
I, th I see it as a more, you know, scaled, uh, yeah, we, we have a scale and I can put things uh, on, on, on a three-dimensional mapping. So it's, I think there is a very um, various uh, approaches uh, in that area, so in nature, uh, technology and architecture uh, interfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Very interesting research, actually. Yeah. Um, I like that you uh, kind of uh, offered an approach by saying that there can be a scalar uh, to define at which site the work is actually belonging to, uh, which might be uh, better to understand the work uh, in deeper detail. So. Yeah, uh, after presentation, I'm really interested in this kind of research, but maybe one more question to you. Is there any lab condition or uh, like, is there any material research that you want to apply in some kind of future? Um, not, uh, I had some uh, lab studies, but it uh, was more on, um, some other also like uh, other theories of gestalt form formation you know codes and etc so it was not specific to this uh, study but it was in a more larger phd sort of research part of it and right now i don't have any uh, lab uh, but uh, it would be yeah, right. also very nice to you know have a hands on um, um, experience uh, of this sort Okay, let's make an open call then. Uh, the is open for collaboration to, <laughs> to further study on the synthetic architecture field. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, is, thank you. Is there any other questions? Because I'm going to take this material discussion to the beginning of the session and ask a question to Beryl Kapusus, uh, Um she presented a work that we can place at the intersection of material and social relations. And uh, I'm actually, uh, my question is about uh, the, about your experience. I mean, how did you get the permission to get into the Venice Biennale archive? And where this archive is located in Venice or is it online archive? Was it open source? How was it and how long did it take? Did you go there and are you going to, yeah, you're going to uh, be doing your research in Venice in near future, I know. And are you going to develop this research while you are there? Yeah, thank, thank you, Sardar Rajam. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was a, it was a nice process actually because I was uh, on the very sites while talking about a, a significant place and an event. So um, the archival research about Venice Biennale was very very essential uh, in, in in my condition. Um, I, I had three trips to Venice uh, from 2016 to um, 18. So I had the chance to experience three Biennales, two architecture, one art. Uh, and the archives are open for access, only you have to make your um, reservations beforehand. Uh, and the, the, all their collections are open uh, for your research. But in my first time, uh, actually, it, by, uh, by the way, the, the archive is not um, digitalized yet. Uh, Italians couldn't do that uh, yet, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, in my first time, uh, it was forbidden to have, have some um, copies and digital um, <clears throat> copies of, of the material, of the original material. But the second time, uh, the law changed. Uh, legislations changed and uh, it was all free. So I had all the visual material on my iPhone and on my uh, iPad. So I had the chance to uh, collect them all, but uh, more more information and more documentation. I mean, it brings its own very problems. So uh, it was kind of a um, um, contingent uh, process, contingent act for me to find some uh, very concluding remarks for my uh, PhD. So it was uh, all uh, on the way, I may say. Um, 
yeah, I'm going to do my postdoc research in uh, Venice as well, uh, but this time I'm, I'm, I will be more um, occupied with architectural education and it's uh, very radical formations in, in the same period that I uh, looked into in my uh, PhD, it's the 70s, and how uh, those different and other forms of uh, architecture and art, artistic research, I may say, um, found, found some space in, in the curriculums, in the methods and techniques of, of architectural educators, which were very main um, theoreticals, uh, theoreticians as well uh, for that period. So it will be a kind of a, a following uh, one uh, in terms of its interaction with other disciplines, uh, including art and media, but uh, it will just say some um, different words uh, and have its own uh, discourse, I may say, uh, at the end, I guess. <laughs> All right, thank you. Very interesting story behind such a nice research. I mean, like, uh, how lucky. How lucky is you, like, <laughs> you yeah. start a research and suddenly the law changes and uh, tata, everything is here. Very good. And it provides further uh, opportunities for you to explore more and more, right? Very nice, very nice. And actually, what was the first motivation and how did you come up with Venice Street Biennale? I mean, were you interested in Venice Biennale from the date that you were born in or how did it come like um, actually, I, I'm, I was pretty interested in, in the Italian design culture when I was in uh, both university and after my grad, through my graduate studies. Uh, and also, I, I, I have learned some Italian, uh, I may say, in an in a, uh, average level, uh, so that I can read and uh, understand Italian texts. Uh, so I'm very interested in uh, the translations as well. I mean, the terms in Italian and how they come to the English in translation and how they were lost, uh, losing their... Um, um, meanings over those translatory uh, processes. And one, one issue I was focusing in my PhD was that you, you're more than welcome to uh, read it if you like that. Um, so I was pretty interested in that Italian uh, culture and I, I was pretty interested in the 70s, uh, as in the Turkish arch uh, architectural history as well. Uh, and Venice Biennale was always like a big show for me to uh, to observe um, through the um, through its digital, I mean, through um, the social and digital life of every work after they, are, they were presented because they all have their own uh, Instagram accounts. I mean, each um, team and each work has their own Instagram accounts and they actually they have a continuing life, a social life afterwards. Um, so it's, it's very interesting for me to um, have an kind of a ethnographer position and how their social life uh, goes on uh, after the um, decision takers such as the architects the curators are done with their job and after all the things are uh, gone and diminished i think it's it's very um it's like a curiosity cabinet for me uh, so um, that that was my position with the venice biennale and how uh, was I, I interested in in the exhibition uh, mode of making in architecture and art as well. Cool, cool, cool. Let's make a warning to people who are in the Venice Biennale. There is someone watching you. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, so you also uh, translate Italian uh, scripts to English and Turkish, right? While you are doing your, your research. Um, there, there, there was a cut in my connection. Right. I, I missed so, it. So I was, I was just wondering if you were uh, translating Italian scripts into English and uh, Turkish during your research. Uh, for, for my postdoc research, maybe. Yeah. Oh, uh, for future, you can do. Yeah, it, it, it's on my mind because um, probably many Italian, I also have a friend uh, working on urban theories uh, and morphological studies uh, in Italian and she, she's just, she was just uh, saying to me that there are a huge amount of uh, written uh, material that was not translated in English. Uh, so we even do, uh, do, do not have their names as well. So probably I will have some more names about about the uh, the field I I'm going to focus. So uh, probably that translation uh, process will be a very important um, um, part level of my uh, research, I, I assume, I guess. 
All right, cool. Thank you very much, Berit. Thank you for your contribution and um, very nice questions. Thank you, Sardar Hocam. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Shema is here. Yeah. Shema, uh, very interesting topic, first of all. Uh, from the beginning of our architecture education in Turkey, uh, we directly confront the question of mosque. I mean, how it was developed, how it became today, and what we are doing, uh, and so on. What it should be, maybe. How maybe, it, yeah. Please. How, uh, how it um, could um, bull, bull uh, like that. Firstly, I'm too excited uh, to talk. I, uh, it was my first presentation in English and online. Uh, and so pardon me if I make a failure. <laughs> I can uh, take oh. your rest. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering if you are going to continue this research with mosque architecture and examining more and more mosques around the world, or are you going to take this kind of research into other forms of architecture? So, because you are kind of evaluating uh, architecture and architectural means. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to continue with the mosque architecture and discuss further, or is it going to be uh, including other forms of architecture? Yes, it could be. Uh, William Wardinger uh, made it with other buildings, other um, um, like church and, and other buildings. Um, but I uh, want to um, search about uh, mosque because uh, it's a um, really um, a, a cause a case in Turkey. So uh, I can uh, choose another mosque or another um, building types, maybe uh, further. Okay, it sounds like. A uh, like a long time research that will make you busy for some time. Yes, uh, it was my uh, master's uh, thesis. Okay. And uh, what, what is your plan about your PhD? Uh, I don't know, but I like to uh, study uh, in uh, architectural psychology so I can uh, maybe continue like that. All right, interesting. Okay, thank you very much, Shema. Uh, it was very uh, interesting and uh, nice to listen to your presentation. I guess, uh, would you like to add anything else? Um, by the way, my supervisor is here, uh, Nigun Kulolo. I want to thank uh, to her. And, to, and thank to uh, you too for uh, your interest. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Nilgün Kulolu was also my uh, professor at university and special regards to her. I know she is chairing another session right now. Yeah, she's here now. All right. Thank you. So uh, is there any questions? I'm listening now, I think, from YouTube. I can't see, maybe there is one. Right, uh, regards to you, Ninkin Kutola. <laughs> Thank you. All right, time is up. Thank you very much for your presentations. It was lovely to listen to you and uh, very interesting research. And I wish very best of luck uh, in your future career and see you again. Thank you.